All right, the recording has begun. Welcome to session 10, the 11th session. Um, who would like to do the retelling? Or at least summarize the situation you guys are in from, uh, from last week's actions. I guess it was two weeks ago. I have not updated the timeline, so uh, that little cheat is not available at the moment. Um... I basically remember a super Cliff Notes version of what happened. Go for it. Uh, so I think that we had a couple things going on. Uh, one, um, Charles was getting us another bag of holding. So now we've got a backup bag of holding, double backup uh, bag of holdings. Um, and then, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember who was there. Barnabas, Evitala, and Rorik uh, were uh, beat up some dude in an alley uh, <laughs> and got rid of him uh, so that uh, Barnabas could fully replace him. He's the Coralanthi delegate, I guess. I don't know what the right title is. Um, so we disposed of that person so that Barnabas can take their place, uh, in full disguise. I think at this point we put them in a, in the bag of holding so that Charles might be able to like, I don't know, reanimate them. I'm pretty sure they're, they're good and dead. Um, and I don't know. I think that was everything that happened at a high level. I'm not sure if I missed anything. Yeah, that was, that was good. Uh, Taking experience point for that. Um, I do want to point out that um, what Charles managed to pull back for you um, was not a bag of holding so much as it's a pair of doors that when attached to a frame that came with them um, and fed a little magic marble that he has a bag of <clears throat> will open into an extra dimensional space. Um, I don't know if any of you have gone into the, to it other than Charles who went into the floor model they had on display at the store. But um, Barnabas did provide a bag of holding towards the yes. end of it. Uh, so Barnabas, to Barnabas has an actual bag of holding. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that Barnabas has had the entire time. You know, it's good to have secrets. But the party is a little bit divided at the moment because Barnabas is by himself in um, the... Uh, the bunkhouse for the family you're pretending to be a member of, um, in the Corlanthi em embassy. And as Dawn dines on, uh, <laughs> as day dawns on the 19th day, the sun is beginning to, uh, to stir some light in the eastern sky. Though it's got a bit of climbing to do before it shows itself. Um, Barnabas, you find yourself awake. All right, uh, Barnabas, you know, stretches, gets up, does his morning routine, puts on some moisturizer or whatever, whatever Barnabas needs to do to get ready. Um, uh, I guess at this point, I'm just like full on taking over this person's life. Um, so. Yeah, the, the documents you guys forged said that you're you're here to take over while they go back to do uh, whatever it is they need to do. Of course, they're never going to arrive there because you murdered them, but um, nobody knows that. And uh, so you've been provided with uh, the reams of blank paper that you're supposed to use to record um, what wealth and riches um, the... Uh, Mining Cooperative would like to uh, emigrate into Corlanth with and become a new uh, merchant house. This is really important to Corlanth society because the, um, the, the amount of wealth of the house is what determines um, 
how close it is to ruling the government for a year. So at this point, um, would I just be waiting for everything to get, you know, put on the ships or whatever? Or is there anything, anything that this person needs to do? Ah, no. So we're not at the point of the ships yet. What's happening today is that the shipment is going to arrive, that the caravan of carts is going to um, come to the north gate of Celebre um, and be processed into customs. Uh, and what the, um, the plan uh, was for you to, to take over what this guy's duty was, and what you find out is that the, this guy's duty is uh, to meet um, the caravan outside the gate before they go through customs and to take an inventory of everything they're bringing in. You are aware, um, as a, a Corlanthi ambassador, uh, that the, um, they will be adding to the riches from their own, and so this is going to give you um, a good indication uh, as to how much money and, and stuff is local to the Celebran economy that they're pulling out versus how much they're shipping from Baron. So your job today uh, Mr. Ambassador, is to uh, leave the, the city by the north gate, meet up with the incoming caravan, um, and perform an accounting of all of the wealth within that caravan um, for later comparison when they arrive at uh, Korloff. Excellent. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll grab my, my abacus and head over to wherever the gates, I guess, are. All righty. Um, your, um, your liaison within the, the embassy um, says, uh, do, you, do you want a bodyguard? I heard th there may have been some rough stuff going on at the docks last night, so if you need some uh, security, we've got some personnel on hand ready. I'm torn if I want. I don't. I'm not sure if I want someone with me. But I guess at this point, it's not not a big deal. I'll just I'll just act out what I'm supposed to be doing. So, um, yeah, sure. I mean, naturally, I would want a bodyguard. So if you could get me your finest guard, that would be great. Okay, a um, a Corlanthi soldier is uh, assigned to basically walk with you, and if anybody tries to stab you, the soldier will stab them right back. Awesome. Alrighty, so you, you have acquired one Corlanthi soldier follower who is not in on the plan. I figured that'll lead to some fun at some point, I'm sure. I, yeah, I, I imagine there may be somebody ha hatching some devious plans to go along with that. Um, all right, so, um, Evitala, are you sleeping in? Absolutely. All right, then. I'm probably not out of bed until noon at best. <laughs> so, uh, nothing of note is going on at the mansion, then. Um, but meanwhile, at the end... Uh, the rest of the party is also waking up. If indeed any of you even went to sleep. I know a lot of you, though, were resting up uh, some of the, the tacks that you take in the first day. Definitely uh, slow. Yeah. Um, dawn is... Day is dawning, and um, you know that Barnabas is going to be on his way to the meeting. Uh, did you want to set up anything along the way to intercept Barnabas? Um, did you want to tail Barnabas? Or, or are you just leaving well enough alone? I'm sorry, are you talking to me? Yes. Okay, can you repeat that, please? Sure. Um, so Barnabas is going to be heading out the north gate. This is known to you because it's part of the plan. Um, to, to meet up with the caravan and basically get some intel on exactly what they have and to try to encourage them to put all their eggs in one basket so you can more easily rob that basket. 
Um, this is not the, them leaving. The caravan is not leaving the city right now. The caravan is arriving. So this is the um, the meetup before the caravan goes through customs um, and the big legal battles begin. Do you want to interrupt or intercept Barnabas on their way or uh, tail them and or like keep a lookout or do you just want to leave everything alone? Um, one sec. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't add in everything that happened last week or last session. No, onto yeah, the no, it's yet. fine. That's okay. I'm actually trying to go back older than that. Who would, I tell you, who are you trying to make look bad again? Uh, the fishing guild? Yeah, the uh, fishermen's uh, guild. And it's because they're supposed to be doing the transport instead of the... Instead of us, <laughs> yes. Instead of us, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I'm assuming right now the fishing guild is not doing the transport, right? Because it's outside Salibre still? Right. Fishing Guild will not be involved until the um, the treasure has been cleared for export uh, by customs. Um, and then the Fishing Guild um, has a contract to uh, actually load it from the caravan onto ships. It's not even sure which ships yet. The ships haven't even been purchased. But it is generally expected that they're going to need at least three galleon-sized ships. Um, and if they go smaller, they're going to need a lot more than that. Okay. Um, I think right now, um, geez, I have an idea. I just don't know how to pull it off and how to do it without getting ourselves in trouble. Okay. If you so. want to think about it for a little bit, we'll move on to Rurik. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. So uh, Rurik, you wake up um, today, you, you have a job and that job is, uh, to meet up with your ward buddy and um, go out the north gate to guard a caravan that's going to be arriving. So I don't have to like role play the whole like, hey, my, you're talking to me, right? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, so I don't have to necessarily role play the whole part where I'm just like, uh, oh, hey, my other job fell through. I need to, I'll take you up on that offer. If there's something other than just accepting it you'd like to accomplish, we can role play that scene. I'll just go for it and just uh, just uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, you you I guess go uh, accepted it at some point. Um, and no, because I had declined initially because I was like, oh, oh I have another job. That's right. You had declined. I mean, we can retcon that, can't we? Somebody had can pay can, can pay a point and retcon that, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, right, because you went back and you you helped them fight at the docks. That's yeah. right. Okay. So a after you left the docks, did you go accept the job? Sure. Okay. Th then she told you, "All right, um, you want to be at the uh, north gate." Um, before sunrise. Poof, I'm here before sunrise. How did people wake up before sunrise, before alarms? In this universe, I'm just going to assume magic, because man, does that solve problems. Yeah. I don't know, though. Like, I, I pretty consistently wake up before my alarm, and it's got nothing to do with sunlight. Yeah, but if you had to wake up at 4 a.m. for something tomorrow, would you be able to do that without a... Farmers do it. Like... <gasps> yeah. <laughs> it's a thing. Uh, now, I would, I would hate myself because I don't like to go to bed that early, but yeah. Alrighty. Alright, so I'm here. I'm ready. I'm recording for duty. 
Okay, um, and she's there with you, so uh, you're there with uh, Delia. Um, a few other people um, start coming to join you guys. Um, there's a, a gentleman dressed in an incredibly drab gray suit. Like what kind of suit? Like a businessy kind of suit? Or like yeah, like a businessy kind of suit. Like um, he's uh, obviously not like a modern day suit, but it's he's he's dressed to um, to some sort of official capacity to demonstrate wealth, right? Not ah. in the not in like the ostentatious way, but the like I paid an expert tailor to make this suit for me, and then for some reason chose gray. Got it. It's, uh, you know, like all those sterile, modern, like, gazillion-dollar homes. Yeah. Um, there is the... Uh, a Fantasy capitalist. Got it. Got <laughs> yeah. it. There's a, a, a somewhat more practically dressed uh, gentleman accompanying him um, with a... Uh, and by practical, I mean practical in the stealth arts. This guy has a cloak with a hood. He's got all the usual stuff. It's not up. He's, you know, he's not hiding in shadows that right now, but you can tell he's geared for it. Um, you're introduced to um, the, uh, the man in gray. He, you're introduced to him as, uh, this is um, Edgar Parrington, the Iron Shadow. He, he's the boss of this operation. Um, he looks you up and down. All right. More muscles always helpful. We'll, uh, we'll need to discuss uh, payment, make sure that um, you find everything acceptable. But... Um, for the moment, and he just hands you a bag of coins, like, I hope that this will take care of today. Um, I just need you to make sure that everybody here stays safe. Nobody gets hurt. Can you handle that? Got it, boss. Alrighty. Uh, he starts introducing you to the uh, the other people as they show up. So he introduces you to uh, Slifan. That's the guy with the, the cloak. He says, this is my chief operations officer. Um, and um, he introduces you to, um, let's see. Oh, yeah. He introduces you to uh, uh, this very, a, a pair of kind of dour-looking gentlemen. Uh, one of them is, um, is Jax. You're introduced to Jax. Um, but Jax doesn't seem to be paying attention to you. Um, Jax is paying attention to something going on uh, with the other gentleman that's there, who um, you also recognize as being the proprietor of the um, the necromancer. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, casino. The proprietor. Yes, the proprietor. They seem to be fiddling with some kind of magical gadget. Um, and when they hear their names being mentioned, they glance up and say, we, we've got to go. We, we, I think we found something. Uh, Did they see me and recognize me? Because I'm no. fucking huge. You're, you're freaking huge, and they're very distracted by this, this tiny little thing they're messing with. Cool. I'm going to try and be an assuming, as, or just kind of like basically go into the whole, like, I'm there's a certain mode that bodyguards go into where they're basically invisible, but visible. So I'm going to assume that position. Excellent. Um, they, uh, they actually take their leave at that point um, and head out. And as you see them taking their leave, um, two more people arrive. One of them you recognize as Barnabas, and the other is some kind of Corlanthi soldier. Uh, Barnabas gets the same introductions, um, and then uh, after waiting for a little bit, um, let's see, uh, Lyria arrives, and Lyria does recognize you. you unless you want to try and make a stealth roll to, to pull off that bodyguard thing, but I mean, you kind of had a pretty close relationship with Lyria. Yeah, I'm also fucking huge. Like, yeah, you're freaking huge. Yeah, it's. I wouldn't be wearing my demon belt because I'm trying to be low key right now, and that thing's kind of uh, obvious. Yeah. But I am also obvious. 
I do have a still, a point, I do have a point in still, um, but it would be an incredibly difficult uh, role to pull off. So Lyria greets you, um, says, you, you must tell me how um, Edgar managed to recruit you as well. You sense there might be a tiny bit of tension between her and Edgar. Well, I came in on the recommendation of a, an old colleague. <laughs> so it says it'd be a shame if they didn't run in the scene, yeah. But I'm not familiar with the client. Is there something I should know? Uh, are you asking her? I'm asking Mary, yeah. Because yeah. like, if, if I'm picking up on the tension, I just kind of like keep it professional and say, you know, I came in with a recommendation of a friend. Um, but is there something I should know about the client? Um, in, in a kind of whisper, she says, we'll meet up later, but loudly she says, no, everything's doing good here. That's good to hear. I think that maybe we're all about to have our financial problems resolved. And as you can see, coming down the road from the northern forest, there is a caravan of 13 gigantic carts being pulled by four horses each. Uh, it and is these are big fuck off like war horses. Huge, yeah. yeah. Barnabas, you are you're there. Um, no one has recognized you, uh, but you do see as you arrive. You see Jax um, and the um, the necromancer. Um, basically leaving the scene and not paying attention to anybody. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm glad my disguise is working. All righty. So um, Edgar is uh, the Iron Shadow. He's uh, um, immediately kind of deferring to you. He says, uh, thank you and thank uh, my pass on my thanks to your government for um, being so courteous as to come here and examine our wares. I would like to uh, assure you that we have nothing but the best intentions for your city. And as the, um, there's actually, there, the, you guys are not the only people out here. There is some other traffic. There's some trade coming in and out, um, some carts and things. But this is, uh, this caravan is definitely dominating the situation. Um, so um, they stop just short of where the guards are examining um, people incoming and, and beginning to process them through customs through the north gate. Um, so the caravan itself is a little bit off to the side of the road uh, when it comes to a halt. Um, guards immediately start pouring out of several of the uh, cars and creating a perimeter. These guards, um, they have matching mining cooperative uniforms, but all of the uniforms look super baggy, like they're not for people of this size. Mercenaries. Not just that. They like it. Really looks like every single one of them is wearing clothing that's too big for them. Like oh, that's like amazing. they stole it off a body for somebody that's twice their size, for some reason. And well, it's, but that's that's highly suspect because at least you would imagine some of them kind of fit a little okay, and then one piece doesn't fit quite right. So it's highly suspect that they're all. Uniformly across it, they all seem to have clothing that is the same amount of too big for them. I will make a note of that. Uh, you may also make a little perception roll, if you wish. Probably investigation plus perception. Would that be me? Would... Either one of you. I wish I could use leadership, but that's probably not. <laughs> Um, and just so you know, 
I think I figured out what I want to do whenever you get a chance. Ah, excellent. So let's let's see the results of these perception rolls, and we'll, we'll ro roll back to your actions. Oh, I have a quick question. I have a talent called anatomist. It says, you have encyclopedic knowledge of the anatomy of common sentient species. You may pay one medicine to uh, gain a plus one T plus one T bonus when treating a commonly encountered sentient species or two medicine for rare or unknown creatures. Do I have any reason to suspect that these are not humans? Uh, no, they definitely appear to be, um, well, mostly humans. There's uh, a couple dwarves. Yeah, like, with, you know, with hum humanoids, not anything special. Yeah. Okay, in that case, I will use that. Hey, one is better than zero. Uh, it is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you guys um, basically noticed what I told you. Um, I could make. I wonder if I could make an argument for scholarship, but I won't worry about it. You could. You could totally make an argument for scholarship. I would accept that. Can I make an additional scholarship rule? Uh, I want to hear your argument for scholarship first, but yes. Ah, uh, shit. Okay. When you said make an argument, I assumed that I'd actually get to hear that. Oh, no. No, no. I'm trying to think of one right now. Uh, do I know of any particular historical or current fighting groups that operate in this way, given my vast military experience? Oh, okay. So we're going to make this um, a military thing. I mean, that would be the thing I am most scholar in to be. If it's yeah. Given if I'm a veteran with leadership skills, then military scholarship would be something that is within my reasonable realm of knowledge. Okay, um, I, I would I would actually say that you've done a better job of arguing for leadership than for scholarship, right there. They're both the same, so. Fuck shit. <laughs> I'm trying my best, but I got I'm too I got too many muscles, guys. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, they're they're. They're wearing normal soldier, soldier stuff. They have weapons on their hilts. They've got a flask of something to drink. They've got, you know, bandolier with, um, uh, like, a quiver for the ones that have uh, mostly crossbows. There's not a lot of bow users here. Uh, just soldier stuff. They have boots. <laughs> They're all wearing cool. boots. Cool. I must have not fucking eaten breakfast today. It's fine. But Barnabas and Does anybody else want to make a perception <laughs> roll? Barnabas fared slightly better, but um, yeah, didn't didn't really add anything to the notes. God damn it! It's okay. Um, so yeah, what is Remy's course of action this morning? Um, so I need to. I want to be out on the road when the wagons are showing up. Preferably with some, I don't know, group of loosely affiliated travelers, like, I don't know, pilgrims or something leaving the city. I don't, I don't know if I can find a group like that leaving the city or something. There's farmers bringing in food. There's, um, because the the Dale lands north of here have lots of like farming communities, hunting communities, people bringing in furs to trade. Salibri is fundamentally a trade city, and this is the the main road that leads north to Baron to the Middle Kingdoms, um, and through a whole bunch of countryside along it. So there's going to be traders galore. Any of that is viable. He's going to like Assassin's Creed blend in with like a little pocket of people. Yeah, I mean that's that's the idea. Cool. Yeah, I'll um, I'll go with the uh, 
with some, yeah, farmers or whatever. Okay. So, um, yeah, my, I need to get to the carts and I want to mark them, mark some of the boxes on the carts with the fisherman guilds mark. That's oh. my plan. So I need to get there. Okay. So you, you, you get to basically a, a situation where you see them going past you on the road. Uh, they don't have boxes on, like, so they are carts, uh, but these carts are fully fully enclosed. So uh, it's more like a, a box car being pulled by uh, horses than it is um, like a, an open cart. Is it like a shipping container, basically? It, basically, yeah. They're gigantic. They have doors on the sides, um, and uh, but yeah, they they do not appear to um, have any kind of like openness to let you see what's going on inside them. You do see, though, that several of them have windows. Uh, it looks like every other car ha cart has windows, um, and those appear to be the ones that have guards inside them. So okay, so... Your estimation is that of the 13 uh, carts, uh, only six of them actually have stuff inside. The other seven is security. Personal. All right, so then I will... I want to try to get a mark on one of the carts that does not have windows and I will even wait for them to stop and let the guards out. Okay. Um, this is definitely a stealth check to not be noticed during this. Where would you like to put the mark? Underneath? Um, on the outside where it's visible? So, yeah, I want it on the outside where it's visible, but I'm going to put it off by, um, by the side of the door. It's like on the door jam. So there's a door, right? Or whatever, like on the door jam next to where they'd open it. Yes. Okay. All right. So and... Pulling this off without being seen, you're going to, uh, especially with watchful guard that are, are expecting people to try and rob them, uh, you're going to need to pull off a stealth with four successes to get the mark on. Awesome. Okay. Um, cool. All right. So my first step, can I scare one of the horses in the group that I'm with so it goes off running? Yeah, they, they probably okay. won't like you much, but that's that's a doable thing. Horses I don't need to be liked. Scared. Yep. All right, what do I have to roll for? Do I roll anything for that? I don't need to be liked. I need to be rich. Yep. Yeah. I can buy friends then. Uh, do we have an animal handling? <laughs> yeah, I think we do. I think it's uh, considered taming. Uh, taming. Oh, taming. There's taming, taming yeah. which I, I totally do not have. What a point, Nick Rose. So it, it doesn't take much to frighten a horse, but the um, if you have taming, you can frighten them in a direction that's more helpful to you. Look at that. I have one taming. Hell yeah. All right. Taming and oh. what? Vigor? I'm just going to beat them. Just going to go right or what? Right. Honestly, like, taming makes a lot of sense for rogue characters because, you know, like, all the crazy things you can do with pets and. Oh, for like, sure. It's good. In an urban environment, there's always, like, stray cats, stray dogs. You can do, pull up all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, I'm upset that none of us has thought to have an animal companion at any point in time. I feel like that, except for, okay, Wolfthar doesn't count because he was like fucking Ash Catcher. And, that's, and, and yeah. Kite also doesn't count the same. Uh, now, um, they didn't have like a singular animal companion, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Hey. Uh, Althorn did gather up all of the stray dogs in Baron when you guys were getting ready to start that um, uh, riot. See, but that's like, 
I mean, that's epic, but... That was tactical, though. That was not, like, a companion thing. It was, yeah. Yeah, they're not, like, buddies, you know what I mean? He just has, like, an army of dogs. An army of wild dogs. <laughs> It, uh, works. it works. Uh, technically, I had a rat companion on the moon. That's true. An undead rat, yeah. Did it have a name? Was it your friend? I'm just saying. You have some cute moments. I'm going to work on that. Work on that. Uh, a companion doesn't have to be your friend. How sad. Aw. Alright, uh, so what do I roll with my taming to uh, scare this horse? Either what, like a cunning, or you could argue the number of things. Um, every, for every success that you get, uh, you can have um, an extra die when you make your stealth check. Gotcha, but. We call this creating your own helper dice. Hell yeah. I mean, it would be like perception and taming for figuring out how to send the horse in the right way, like the most useful place to send them. Would that be cunning and taming for figuring it out? Or is it straight up like vigor, like I'm just just gonna wail into him. <laughs> like that's that's the bigger argument. If if you're asking me what I think is the most appropriate based on what you've uh, you've described, um, yeah, I I would say either perception or empathy would be the, uh, the yeah, most okay. appropriate. Perception then. I'm looking for where I think the horse can do the most damage. Nice. All right. Oh fuck yeah, dude! Yes. You ain't horsing around. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. Um, you, you appear to have very good aim with your horse here. So uh, yeah, where did you send it? What does it do? Uh, so, yeah, I startle the horse, and it just, it takes off and goes running right towards the line of, uh, guards. Okay. And then, um, it starts, it's, uh, I guess it's, uh, thoroughly freaked out, so it just starts kind of, like, running up and down the line, sort of, like, flailing, I don't know, like, up on its hindquarters, like, thrashing its legs around, because it's obviously scared of the people. It doesn't want to... It's not going to just run through them. It's not a war horse. But it doesn't want to go back to the road. Okay. Um, and then you now have three bonus die for your uh, stealth check there. All right. Is this going to be agility, agility and stealth, I'm assuming? For sure, yeah. Get in, get out, leave your mark. Of course. <laughs> uh, you, get three help, you get three on top of that. No, no, no. Oh, no. shit, no. That fuck. includes my three. Oh, no! Yeah. Devastating. Ooh. Wait, wait, wait. Are there any difficulty penalties? Because I do have Daywalker. I may spend one spell to avoid difficulty penalties using stealth in bright environments. Um, yes. So your difficulty penalties are um, alert guards, uh, bright environments, uh, yeah, and and numerous people watching. That's your your main difficulty penalties right there. Okay, so if I spend that one day walker to avoid difficulty penalties. Okay, then yeah, then you succeed. 
Yes, talents. Oh yeah. Talents are amazing. All right on. Uh, you you slip in while everyone's distracted. You uh, put that mark on the door frame. Is this supposed to be something that is going to be obvious and anybody looking at it is going to see, or is this something that like a thief would notice? Um, slight, slightly obvious. My my hope is that Barnabas sees this when he's counting the the cards and makes some comment about why why this one is marked. That's that's my hope. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so I don't want it completely hidden. That's why I want it on the door jam. And my wouldn't next question is... Kinda... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Wouldn't you want it to be, like, slightly clandestine, but not maybe, like, perhaps a little, like, not well done? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not trying to, like, put a flag where, like, the guard's going to turn around and hopefully see it, but, like, yeah, if, bar if someone walks up to the door, like, it's like someone's first time marking something kind of thing. Like, they'll see it. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, my next question then is which cart do you mark? So I'm going to let you know that um, all of the odd numbered carts, 1 through 13, uh, are guard carts. You specifically said you wanted one that doesn't have windows. So those are the even numbered ones, 2 through 12. Um, we will do 6. Number six, okay. Has anybody got a diagram like they got in the heist movies? We got the blue paper with the white lines. We got the <laughs> we got the caravan all mapped out. I have my notes all mapped out. That's totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now I have noted that the uh, the fishing guild symbol is marked on it. Cool. Huh? So, um, yeah. So Jackie, you uh, Rorik notices that uh, a runaway cart is heading towards the people that you are currently hired to protect. You mean horse? Yeah. Uh, oh, it was just the horse, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's a runaway horse uh, kind of charging towards people you're trying to protect. Okay, I tell them to fall back in line, and I kind of just, like, have them to my back and put myself forward, and we sort of kind of, like, wiggle our way away from the horse. The horse is spooked. Um, it's, it's just in a blind panic, not moving intentionally. Do you want to try to calm it? Uh, do you want to aggressively like intimidate it away, or do you want to tackle it? I, I, what What is your play here? I, I don't know. Please tackle it. Sure, let's fucking tackle, tackle it. Tackle. tackle it. Tackle it, guys. I want to make the crowd happy. Let's go. Fucking jock mode engage. All righty. That, that is an unarmed attack right there. So, oh, fuck. It's not melee. Uh, unless you decide to swing a weapon at the sword. You want to chop it in half? I always have a shield. I always have a buffer. Okay. Uh, you you could do a shield charge. That's your... Um... It's kind of my thing. Yeah. Uh, so that would be vigor and melee? Yep. So you're going to do a shield bash on it. Yeah, and I have shield proficiency. Ah, so no horseplay. Don't think the horse would consider this play. Oh, you rolled in Talus instead of Session. That's what's Oops, going on. sorry. Yeah, I have the um, I have the recording set to um, show results from session in the recording. No worries. So you got five successes. I forgot to that I have anatomist, which I could have paid a point of medicine to do that thing I talked about earlier. Uh, but that's all good. Five 
five is pretty good. Let's see how I do against a horse. Let's see how the bull does against the horse. All right, so you um, basically deflect the horse. Uh, it is a horse. They're they're yeah. huge. Um, I'm also huge, but I'm not you're, as huge as a horse. You're also huge, yeah. Um, but primarily what you, you do is you deflect the horse. Uh, you kind of... Um, it becomes unstable, falls on its ass, gets back up, notices that it's not being eaten by anything, it's a little calmer, and its farmer is running after it to try and get it. Um, notably, however, you impressed your employer, who's quite pleased to see that you went immediately to a, a semi-violent solution to protect them. This w is a different result than if uh, you had uh, somehow tamed the horse. Um, this guy is not interested in his enemies being tamed. He's far more interested in them being bashed. Yeah, and I have an impressive uh, physique and strength level. So. Yeah. So it, was a, it was a good um, demonstration good that, that he's uh, recruited somebody useful. Chalk mode! <laughs> With that, uh, that hazard successfully... Um, avoided. Um, the, uh, the caravan comes to a, a stop. The, um, again, like it's kind of off the side. All of the, the soldiers come out, they form a perimeter, um, and uh, Barnabas, you're invited to go through the perimeter and to begin your inspection. All right, I will uh, head through the perimeter. All right. Um, as I've said previously, there are 13 carts. Uh, the odd number carts are the, the guard carts. You may examine them if you wish. Um, you're at cart number one, which is a, a guard cart. And inside it you see um, sleeping and um, eating arrangements. It's a pretty big cart. Uh, so it has a, a table with some uh, benches that are part of, like physically a part of the cart in there. There's some chests that look surprisingly nice, like like really high quality chests. Um, and one of them's open, you can see that like it's not treasure inside, it's just like clothing and, and supplies and stuff, spare weapons and things. Um, but yeah, and then bunks for all the guards. I assume for the guard carts I'm not needing to like take inventory, right? Of any of the goods? That is up to you. You can be as... Nobody here has any idea what you're supposed to be doing, um, so whatever you say, is they, they will probably believe. Excellent. Okay, in that case, I am going to take full inventory of what they have on the guard carts. So, like, basically I'm trying to take an inventory of their weaponry, any valuables, how many guards are there, that sort of thing. So just basically any intel I can get on each guard cart, so... I know I'm just at cart one, but I'll just start tallying things up. Yeah, so um, the what you notice in the carts is that um, these guards have two sets of weapons. They have short swords, which they currently have equipped. But inside the cart, there's another set of much heavier weapons. Mauls, um, war hammers, uh, giant like two-handed axes, really, really big, sturdy weapons um, are on the inside. There's even some like two-handed bull axe stuff like halberds and glaives. Um, it does seem to be individual to the guards, so these guys seem to be um, not a unified army, but instead um, like mercenaries that have their, their weapon of choice. Um, but they, the unified uh, thing they're doing right now is all of them have a short sword on uh, that they're wearing, and they did not leave that behind in the cart. There are a couple spare uniforms. They're also of that kind of oversized... Um, make. Um, and then there's uh, basic stuff. There's uh, rations. Um, there's a couple barrels that uh, have spigots on them for stuff. Um, so yeah, you, you imagine, I mean, these guys did just spend um, about three weeks on the road in, in this space. Um, and it, while it looks like a fairly comfy space for a night or two, uh, you imagine that they're very cramped having spent uh, three weeks traveling in this condition. All right. Are there any cups around? I'm thinking of, yes. like, grabbing a drink of whatever's in one of these barrels and maybe trying to, like, 
shoot the shit with one of the guards. All right, uh, they do have cups. Um, they, they, one, one of the guards says, uh, can, can I... Uh, I'm sorry, it's not even... The guards, the guards are outside, they're guarding the, the thing. They're not in there with you. Um, but... Um, what is... Uh, Edgar um, says, uh, can, can I pour you a drink? Yes, that would be great. Okay. Um, he takes a pair of cups over to one of the spigots, pours a drink for yourself and for him, and um, brings it back. And it's it's a, a mild beer. It says the the good stuff, of course, is further in, but um, I'm happy to uh, to share this with you. Um, I. Hope this meets with your satisfaction. I, I don't intend to bring um, much from in here, but the personnel I do intend to bring with me. So the, the, the men who live here will be traveling. Um, I do not consider them property, so I did not uh, register them. I consider them to be employees. This Edgar guy traveled with them, right? No. He's been here in the city waiting for them to arrive. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, how did you uh, find these guards? Uh, again, they're, they are employees of the Mining Cooperative. They uh, worked with us, um, served us for many years. Um, m most of them have family in Baron. Some have family here in Salibre. If you're concerned about their loyalties, I can guarantee that every single one of these men was handpicked for their absolute loyalty to the mining cooperative. Are these guards the ones with the ill-fitting uniforms? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm curious, why why do all the guards have um, ill-fitting garb? What, what's up with that? Oh. He smiles, he says. Well, we haven't gotten to the cart with all of those details yet. Interesting. I guess uh, I guess I'll find out when we get to that cart. Is that right? Indeed. Indeed. All right. Well, I've got a lot to do, so I'm going to move on to the next cart. So I'll move on to cart number two, which I believe is where I will actually start counting inventory of valuables. So cart number two, um, it has no windows, but when you open it, there is magical lighting on the inside. Um, and this cart, um, it's, it seems fairly sparse until you remind yourself of just how big the cart is. Uh, but this is the magic items cart. Um, and... If you're going to take the time to count everything, I will tell you what's in here. Please. But the, okay, yeah. Keep a detailed Edgar, <laughs> Edgar does say, like, this is, these are the magical items that we intend to bring. Everything in this cart is enchanted with some kind of magic. Um, and to ensure the stability of the spells, we have refrained from putting them in uh, any kind of extra-dimensional portals or bags of holding. Are you being super thorough noting everything? Oh, definitely. I'm, I'm okay. going to be taking inventory of everything. There are 18 swords, 6 daggers, 3 axes, 7 bows, 3 quivers, 5 suits of armor, 6 staves, 12 That's wands... <laughs> Should I just assume I have a, 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 a list of everything, or...? Um, What's the extra shiny ones? That's what we really want. I will paste it into Talus chat. Cool. Or session chat. Either one. Yes, yeah, session chat. I could always also just add to my inventory, oh, list of everything in the cart. <laughs> Every single one of these glows with magic, um, and every single one of them has a, uh, a little scroll along with it. None of them are out in the open. All of them are wrapped up in either cloth or leather, 
um, and inside a uh, metal cage that requires a key to open. Um, but uh, each one hanging outside the cage is a, a little scroll um, of uh, like a leather rolled up scroll that when you unroll it has written in it a, a basic description of what the item is and what it does. Um, none of these are what you would call like artifacts. They're all enchanted like practical things. Um, the swords are enchanted to be more damaging or to be more more precise, more accurate, lighter weight, stuff like that. Um, some they've, of got, the, they've got uh, a bot, an aimbot. For the sword. Yeah, it's yeah. These are, <laughs> these are like you know the, the kinds of weapons that in Dungeons and Dragons would just be described as as plus one or plus two, plus three. Uh, they don't have any of those cool like sentient enchantments on them. But um, what about the wands, rings, and cloaks? Yeah, so the the wands uh, they are all spells that have been enchanted into a wand, and the wand can activate that spell. And there's a pretty significant variety. Most of the stuff in here is dangerous, like damaging. You could use this stuff for warfare. Oh, um, are the staves like uh, like fighting staves or magic no, pieces? Like, like, like wizard, wizard staves, yeah. Gotcha. What about the armor? Is it more like plus one shininess, or more like this armor makes you run, you're the fucking bionic man? Yeah, so um, the, there's five different suits of armor, but you, you basically you have um, a, a couple that are, are strength enhancing, um, a couple that make you just really hard to hurt, um, and then uh, one of them that um, seems to have some, um, like, um, I don't know, how do I put this? Um, the armor itself seems to be able to project fields of force around it according to its description. So the armor is kind of offensive rather than defensive. Thorns. Yeah. It's, it's the kind of armor you would wear if your plan was to run into the middle of the enemy instead of staying on the line with your uh, teammates. God, so many options for me. Uh, the rings run the gambit of magic rings. Uh, you've got um, a, a couple actual rings that seem to have uh, spells and are kind of like ro rods or wands, but the um, most of them are rings that um, apply certain effects. Um, none of these are like super rings with permanent effects, but you do have rings that um, can trigger temporary magical effects such as invisibility, flight, um, spider walking, um, and other things. A lot of them are maneuvered based. So like um, there's a ring of blink, for example. Um, all of them have a number re regarding the suspected number of charges, but you do notice that all of them are like estimated how many charges are left. None of them seem to know exact numbers. And they mentioned that they weren't storing them in a bag of holding. Is that because they would potentially lose their magical powers? Uh, I think it's interference. He said that he's worried about that. He says, I, I don't know enough about the magics of these, and I, I'm simply being cautious and not risking it. My understanding is that bags of uh, holding are an, another dimension entirely in which the rules of magic are different. And so putting an item uh, in there may disable it, either temporarily or permanently, or I, I really don't know. And simply not knowing is good enough reason for me to not use that form of storage for these items. All right. Don't think I forgot about the cloaks. I'm interested in all of this stuff. Yep. Um, you've got um, cloaks of stealth. Um, a cloak of floating, and you have a, a cloak of um, many things, which has little patches sewn into it that can become objects when you remove them from the cloak. Uh, hang on a second. That sounds like some chaos child shit. There's that one chick, she drew pictures, and then bam, whatever. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of like that. Uh, the, the, the difference is you can't draw whatever you want. Uh, yeah. the, the mage who made the cloak, put some stuff into it. Um, and all of that stuff the mage had to actually have. 
have. So the maids basically took some items that they thought were going to be useful, uh, transmuted them into patches that were sewn onto the cloak, and as long as they're stuck to the cloak, the transmutation uh, holds and keeps them as a patch. But as soon as you remove them from the cloak, the spell wears off and they become the item again. Gotcha. What sort of items are... Um, there's a, a boat, um, a rope, um, a torch. Um, a lot of it seems to be fairly practical stuff. It's basically a Batman utility belt. Yeah, yeah basically. Good. Grappling hook. Yeah, what about cloak number four? Is there... Or is it all of them? Uh, so that, that was cloak number four. Cloaks one and two were um, cloaks of stealth. Oh, and cloak three stealth. is a cloak of floating. Got it, got it. So two stealth cloaks. Very nice. Lord knows I need that shit. Very cool. Look at all the goodies that we can potentially use to our advantage. Yeah, those definitely could come in handy later. Basically, we just have to Jackie Chan our way through this shit. If there's a ladder, you use the ladder. You know what I'm saying? Is there's a chair, you use the chair. Yep. Uh, meanwhile, back in town, Charles, is there anything you'd like to get up to? Um, let's see. So I've gone and figured out my stuff for my for that one spell, right? So um, yes, I have the dimension door, or the dimensional door that I have here. Yeah, you actually ended up using the bag of holding to figure out the spell, but you do still have two dimension doors and a frame that you could set up. Because yeah, I definitely want to test uh, the mechanical stuff on that, like to make sure that. I can see like the differences between the two objects, like of the big holding stuff and the bit and the doors. To be able to see if I can, um, I guess, if I need to do some of the other stuff with my with this with these spells I'm crafting, um, to see if it, I guess a more stable version because it seems like the 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 bag of holding is a less stable version of the doors, but the doors hold less. Um. So. You're not sure what the exact relationship is between the doors and bags of holding. You do know that you can take the bag of holding safely into the doors. Um, when you were inside the display model, it looked like a really, really big room inside the door that you could actually walk into and put things down in. It had gravity. Um, the bag of holding doesn't have gravity on the inside. Um, it doesn't have clearly defined walls, floors, or ceilings. It's kind of like an infinite silver void. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it has infinite capacity. Uh, as a wizard, you would know that, like, if it's um, some bags of holding, if their capacity is exceeded, they just lose items to the void. The items fall into the astral plane and they're just gone. Um, others, when they start getting near capacity, they just won't let you put other things in. But the way to find out about a bag of holding is to you try to overload it. That's the, the main way to figure out what its response is going to be. Um, these doors, on the other hand, have very clearly defined boundaries on the inside. They're about uh, 50 feet wide, uh, about 12 feet tall, and the room goes about uh, 300 feet deep. Okay, and does it uh, do anything with, uh, with that can with the cantrip? Or is this like the numbers and stuff I get from like holding? Oh, uh, with Delterra's Toolkit? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, Delterra's Toolkit um, fires up a lot of question marks when you're looking at both. Um, but um, with a little bit of study, you uh, manage to figure out um, that a, a lot of the question marks are just um, they're placeholders for astral energy. Um, you do not see the same kinds of question marks inside the door as you do uh, in the bag of holding. Um, the door seems to be using um, ethereal energy as opposed to astral energy. That okay. might be why it's safe to take. Like, that's a good, 
the good thought as to why it might be safe to take the bag of holding into the door. Whereas you stick, normally if you stick a bag of holding in another bag of holding, you ruin both. And generally cause severe discomfort to the, the room that you're in. Uh, yeah. Um, also another thing, uh, does, so I can, uh, when, when it comes to the door, do I need to actually, like, put a new door, like, put a hole in the wall, or do I just plop it onto the wall and it sort of does its thing? It has to be put in its frame. So you, they gave you a frame that you can assemble. You don't have to assemble it at a wall. You can assemble it in the middle of a room if you like. Um, but the door has to be placed in the frame, and then the frame has to be fed one of those little magic marbles. You were also cautioned not to be uh, inside when the door closes, because the door will only stay open for a certain amount of time, um, unless you have um, a sufficient supply of air, which is why they gave you um, a bunch of uh, potions of... Um, they're, they're, potion, they're not really potions you drink, they're just potions you open up, and the, the potion evaporates into breathable air. So you, you have some of those. I believe the scent they gave you was fresh baked bread. Yeah. Um, so what I want to go do is I'm going to, with my doors, I'm going to go to um, see if I can find um, uh, like some rundown uh, cemeteries because I want to. I'm going. I want my plan is to fill uh, the two doors. Like I'm going to stick the doors up. I'm going to fill them with a bunch of dead bodies. So then I can. So when I get them on the ship, I can open them up and uh, resurrect, re re revive them all to take over the ship. Okay, so your plan is to go grave robbing. Yes. Alrighty. We'll, we'll come back to that and make some rolls in a bit. Uh, yeah, um, and also just oh, um, one other thing is, um, do we know exactly what kind of route they're going from here to the to the actual place? Like the, like, like the ship is supposed to take? If, uh, no, because the, the current suspicion is that uh, Customs is going to claim the items um, and secure them, and then there will be a legal battle as to whether or not they're uh, allowed to release them to be transferred, exported out of the city, or if they have to stay and be um, taxed. Okay, because so my idea is also is to figure out if there's um, any famous ships that have sunk along the route that they've been on, potentially use that as a backup. Oh, that would be a good idea, too. Um, the university would probably have some good records on that, if you'd like to make a trip there instead of the graveyards. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the books, and then I'll go to the, uh, the, I'll, I'll go to the other place after that. Okay. So we'll, we'll come back to you when you arrive at the, uh, the university. Um, is Evatala awake yet? Uh, let's say yes. Okay. What would she like to do? Uh, well, so the problem is we're going to be getting the end close with, uh, the my cooperative is Evitala is known to just about everybody that's going to be there. Yes. So, um, <laughs> she is going to get with, uh, the servants or whatever, and um, come up with some form of disguise. So she's uh, usually a blonde, so she'll uh, now be a redhead. And um, you know what, screw it. She's, she's going to try and look as much like a uh, sailor as possible. <laughs> Okay, that's one way to do it. Full on sailor. One of your servants does suggest, says, uh, ma'am, um, if you, if you want to be unseen, uh, simply dress as a servant. No one looks at us, ever. They, they, they intentionally avert their gaze. I let the comment pass without response. But listen, they're right, though. Think about it. Like... Think about, you have to reflect on your own internal revulsion that you're experiencing upon having, the, the thought of having to gaze upon the poor 
and to those of a lower social standing than herself. The invisible voice that you refuse to look at says, I'm sorry for mentioning it, madam. Of course we will go with your plan. I will prepare a sailor's outfit immediately. Uh, yeah. Make sure it's a high-class sailor. Oh. I'm going to be looking like fucking Elizabeth Swan on this fucking place. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, they um, they begin uh, preparing some options for you. Um, would you like to go with professional, um, like uh, prof professional, like shipping sailor person, um, pirate? That's always an option. Um, or they also have some uniforms that are typical of some of the various navies. Salibre's so navy is primarily made of um, members of the fishing guild. Um, they, they, they just basically gave their fishermen weapons and told them to protect traders. And it works pretty well, actually. They're kind of a rough bunch. Uh, oh. The problem is Evatala absolutely says pirate here, so I have to go with that. But what about Navy? Oh. I didn't want to post it. <laughs> I saw that. We're going Navy. Fuck yeah. In the Navy. Dude, as soon as you said, like, Navy, I was like, I started furiously fucking Googling some very, like, obscure Japanese shit to post in here. Yeah, that looks awesome. You know exactly what would change our mind on that. Yeah, I did. I was like, I know the perfect thing to post. So you're essentially assembling not just like a Navy outfit, but like an Admiral's outfit, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like you're giving yourself top rank and everything. Oh my god. <laughs> Indeed. This is gonna be, be so good, dude. There's like, there's like ten medals that she's never heard. For, for the sake of suspense, too, we're not gonna roll for this until you're about to meet somebody while we're in it. <laughs> That's good. Meanwhile, back at the caravan, I believe, Barnabas, you have arrived at... Um, now, cart three is just another guard's cart. It's identical to cart one. Um, cart four, however, is another closed-door cart. Wait, sorry, what was up with cart three? Cart three is identical to cart one. It is a guard cool, cart. Okay. And it, it, it had an additional six guards living inside it, basically. Cool. All right. Then I will start to inspect cart four. Cart four opens up and cart four is an interesting looking place. A lot of it looks kind of like a workshop and scattered around it are body parts of robotic Petrish. Uh, On a meta level, I'm good. At this feels disturbing. Yeah. Uh, now... I mean, I, I know how, how they work. I know how they work, but it's still like, that's their stuff. And I'm not sure how much Barnabas knows about the Petrish. Um. Yeah. Um. They, they've had interactions with Celebre. Uh, they've had interactions with the Middle Kingdoms and with, um, but, and with Baron. Most of their interactions have been trade relations. They would show up with... A whole bunch of ore they dug up out of the ground and they would trade it for uh, crafted things, generally like ingots and stuff. Um, but you also do know that um, Baron briefly employed some uh, some automatons that seemed very much like the Petrish. Uh, amongst the, the body parts that you do see here, you see arms that have gigantic drills and hammers where a hand should be. Um, you see a, a couple completed bodies that are just, um, they're inanimate. 
they seem to have all the parts, mm -hmm. but also if there's lots of, of parts, and a lot of them are sorted. You've got racks that have like miscellaneous left arms, miscellaneous right arms, left okay. legs, right legs, torsos. I'm, I'm less disturbed by this than on a meta level. It seems more like logistic, kind of like we have Petrish that we work with and here's a bunch of spare parts and shit. Yeah, it, it seems very much like that. Um, there are also some jars that have um, what look like little mosquitoes inside them. They're not animate. They're all just kind of sitting still inside the jars, like uh, like little preserved insects. The, um, are they like in spaces? Uh, or shut down. Huh. Um, but they appear to be um, made out of base metals, brass and copper. There's also lots of workbenches where work can be done on them. Um, the, the lots of tools. Um, and there are, um, lying on the ground, there is like a, a little tarp covering a pile of stuff. Like spare parts and things. Go ahead and make an investigation plus perception check. Okay, that's that's not terrible. So, um, the pile of spare parts seems to be that's like has the tarp over it seems to actually be trying to hide something under the parts. It seems like a double ruse. Like if you take the tarp off, you see the parts, you go, oh, okay, it was just parts. But underneath those parts, there are a pair of doors, not attached to anything, no hinges, just plain doors. And it's suspicious to you that they appear to have been um, hidden under a pile of spare bits. Are the doors like? Are they door? Are the doors attached to the cart? Nope. Interesting. Yeah. How big are they? Size of uh, the, actually the same size as the doors that um, Charles brought back from his uh, attempt to find uh, extra dimensional portals. Oh my, oh my. Looking around, you do note that against one wall is something that looks kind of like a frame. It was hidden amongst all of the workbenches, so it wasn't obvious to see at first. But now that you know what to look for, you can spot where they would install the doors to activate the portal and open them up. Well, I mean, I have to take a thorough inventory, so I am definitely going to try and put the doors into the frame. All right. Um, so um, Edgar sees that you're uh, reaching for the doors. Says, oh, oh I'm sorry. I, we, this should have been cleaned up. I apologize. Um, let, let me have uh, someone take care of that for you. I don't, don't need you to get your hands dirty with this. I need oh, don't, don't mind me. And I'll just keep continuing doing what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'm just doing my job here, you know, don't mind me. Okay, so he, he, um, steps aside, but he does call a couple of his guards over to help you clean the, uh, the parts off the doors, um, and then you, you're able to bring them erect. Um, he has on his belt a bag with the, uh, the little blue marble, so now that the jig is up, he takes out a little marble and offers it to you to use to activate the frame and open the door. All right, yeah, I'll, I'll grab the marble from him and proceed to activate the door. All right, you place the marble in the frame. Um, there's a, a soft glow of blue light, and you hear a sort of click as the door um, unlocks. And you're then able to open the door and see what is a, a room even bigger than the train. It's, um, like I described earlier, it's about 50 feet wide. It goes about 300 feet deep. Uh, the ceilings are vaulted, they're about 12 feet tall, um, and this room is filled with rack upon rack of more spare parts. And that's the first of the two doors. All right. That's exciting. Uh, I... I wonder if I should go in and investigate. 
do I get a, do I get any do I have any sense that that would be a bad idea? Um, on the one hand, there would be a lot of information in there. Like you could maybe take an inventory of just how many of these he's got. Um, on the other hand, there's only one way in or out, and if the door closes, uh, you don't have any air to breathe. Yeah. I'm not sure how much I trust these people I just met, so I'm not going to go in there. All right. Um, so you back out. I, uh, they, he helps you take down the door and set up the second one. Uh, the second one, instead of parts, it has completed frames. Uh, it is row upon row, a, a small... You would say, like, this is actually a kind of a, a, a couple military units worth of uh, what look like um, combat Petrish. Do they look fully completed? Is that what you said? Yes. They're not uh -huh. piloted, but they're the, these are frame body frames that are fully completed. Holy shit. All right. Well, that's pretty epic. So I'll just start jotting this down, you know, like I'm taking thorough notes. And then once I'm done taking my notes, I'll uh, tell him he can disassemble the door. He disassembles this. They are quite impressive. I, I'm sure you would agree. Unfortunately, they're all inactive since our uh, confrontation in Baron. Um, but I have kept them as a private curiosity to see what I can learn. A... a so you say an eccentricity of mine is that I, I do enjoy knowledge, and so this is uh, a yeah, private endeavor of mine that I, I do intend to continue when I arrive at your fair city. Understandable. It's, it's good to have hobbies. Thank you. Shall we proceed to the next cart? And yes, let's move forward. Alrighty. Um, so... Of course, cart, um, let's see, cart number five is more guards. And then you come upon cart number six where you notice something interesting. Somebody seems to have um, inscribed a fishing guild symbol in a clumsy but subtle-ish way, like they were trying to hide it from all but the right eyes, um, on the, uh, the, the, the frame of the door that leads into cart number six. Did, did Remy do anything to indicate that it was, like, it was Remy putting the mark there for Barnabas to see? Nope. Okay, it's just the mark. So. Now, yeah, your, your understanding, or at least the understanding of the character your character is playing, is that this is supposed to be the mining cooperative stuff. But this is a mark of the Celebran Fishing Guild. Yeah, I'll definitely call that out. So, um. Uh... I'll like take a closer look and at like the mark and you know uncover or whatever if it wasn't like fully visible um, and point that out to what's his name Edgar? Yes. Edgar is alarmed by this. Uh, he says that is interesting. Uh, he calls over some of his guards, points to it, and is like, "When did this happen?" Uh, and so they go off to review uh, security logs. Um, Slifan stays with you to make sure you don't try anything funny. Um, and um, yeah, you're permitted to enter the door while they try and figure out when it, they could have possibly had somebody mark a, a fishing guild mark on their door. All right. Cool. I will proceed to take inventory of cart six. Cart six consists of 22 chests um, arrayed on shelves around it, and each one uh, marked with a, an, again, a, like a little slip of paper with an indication of what's in it. I'm going to check. Uh, I'll just look at one of, the, one of the chests and the paper and then verify whether or not the chest contains what the paper indicates. Uh, opening the chest, you find that the chest is a extra-dimensional portal. 
it is significantly deeper than uh, its physical reality. Um, and what's inside it is not in a pile, but is actually floating in this incredible um, silver space. Uh, when you reach your hand in, you can feel uh, the sort of magical sensation that you could call to your hand any of the items within the chest. Um, and from what you can see, all of the items in the chest are bright yellow topaz. All right. And what did the paper next to this chest say that was in the chest? Uh, topaz, parentheses, yellow. All right, cool. I'm going to do that for all of the chests. Okay. So you find that in total they have um, a just truly staggering number of both cut and uncut uh, stones of the following types. White quartz, rose quartz, citrine, amethyst, corundum white, corundum brown, beryl pink, pearls, aquamarines, topaz white, topaz blue, topaz yellow, those are three separate chests, garnets green, garnets yellow, garnets purple, garnets red, opals, sapphires pink, sapphires yellow, sapphires blue, rubies, and diamonds. Cool. I just took a note. All the gems? All the gems. <laughs> All right. All the crystal gems. That is awesome. All right. Well, uh, so I'm going to also, uh, could I do a further investigation of this cart just to see if there's anything that doesn't meet the eye? Yes. Go ahead. I'm beginning to think that Barnabas just isn't very good at investigating things. Uh, you find nothing unduly suspicious. Um, there, there are other things in the room other than the chests. There's like an accountant's table, um, and it's got a bunch of gem crafting equipment on it. Um, but um, it doesn't seem to have been used in a long time. You would imagine that trying to do the delicate art of gem cutting while traveling down the road in a bouncy cart probably doesn't work very well. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Well, I guess I will move on to the next cart. All righty. Meanwhile, in the Celebre, um, Charles, you have arrived at the university. All right. You wanted to research um, histories of uh, ship sinkings. Is that correct? Uh, yes, and the most like more common uh, routes to um, to uh, what's it? What, I always going to forget the name. The place that the, the, the ships are supposedly going to. Uh, Half Elven is uh, where you're going to. Yeah. That would be the first stop, and then from Half Elven to Corlon. Yeah, Corlon. Yeah. Okay. Um, where would you like to start your search? Wizards love history, but this is um, a university that's currently in a renaissance of inventing magic. So where do you want to try to find the history books within this place? Different answers will generate different difficulties. Um, like, uh, is there like main sections of this library that like is divided into? Yeah, the library is divided into research sections based on the different schools of magic. Uh, so you have um, evocation, uh, basically damage spells, fireballs, and the like. You have necromancy, which you visited previously, um, divination, um, enchantment, and charm, abjuration, which is all about protecting yourself. Um. Is it just protecting people, or can you? Is it for like protecting other things? Abjuration, like you protect ships and stuff. 
Um, yeah, abjuration is general protection. So it's about trying to prevent things from falling apart, making them immune to damage, uh, stopping fireballs. Yeah, I think that might like go into the abjuration section because if it, like um, it, it might be like you know like how, like these are like things that have happened in, in the past, whoever, and like how to like how we uh, stop them from happening now. Okay. Let's go ahead and make a scholarship plus um, cunning. Or focus, actually. Um, okay, so scholarship plus focus means you're taking longer to do it, but you're going to have a lower difficulty if you do that. So if you do scholarship cunning, um, you're looking at uh, difficulty three. If you do scholarship focus, difficulty two. Um, I'll just I'll do I'll do uh, um, focus. Okay. I'll take some time. So you're gonna be there for a while, but it's an easier thing to do. Oh, wow. You nailed that. All right. Um, yeah, you, you find um, a, in addition to finding a history of, um, like, it's not a complete history, but you find out about a lot of ships that have gone down. Because if you look at the map, um, it's a very narrow corridor. If you pull up the Atlas War map, um, you'll see that, oh, I just hit the wrong button. There we go. You'll see that from Salibre down to Half Elven, there's basically only one way to go. And so all the ships that have run into piracy or uh, combat or destruction along that path have sunk along that path. They, there really isn't any leeway to the east or west to go. It's just a north-south um, inland channel of ocean. It's fairly wide. You know, like ships don't have trouble sailing in it as though it was ocean, but you are never out of sight of the shore on either side. And so, yeah, um, you, you have a list of ships that um, are known to have sunk in various combats. But in addition to finding that out, you also um, learn some abjuration spells that have been used to protect ships in the past. You learn an, an oversized version of um, a spell shell, which is just a spell to stop other spells. It'll it'll eat the the first fireball that comes at it, and then it's gone. All right, and what circle is that? Um, at that size, it is a third circle spell. But it'll take any any spell up to third circle, and it will just uh, it will cancel it out, and then it itself be dispelled, and it's large enough to encompass an entire ship. You believe it's probably strong enough that um, it could withstand a couple uh, second circle spells, or maybe even three first circle spells. But the uh, the main instance in the tomes you've examined of its uh, use was in a ship combat in which uh, fireballs were being sent at ships to try to burn down their rigging to make them inoperable. Uh, okay. All righty, that, that's going to occupy you for most of the day, getting that ready. But that's a good addition to your spell, especially if you are planning to get yourself into some ship-to-ship -ship combat. Evitala, 
You have assembled your admiral's outfit. Uh. Or, to be more accurate, your servants have assembled it, and you've taken credit for it. It was my idea. It absolutely was. They had a, some kind of silly idea about you dressing as a servant, which is obviously never going to happen. Unbelievable. So I have no plan from here. <laughs> <laughs> but you look that, fabulous. See, what I like about this, this non-plan is that it totally feeds into Evitala's worst desires, which is, of course, she wants to play the criminal, but she cannot help but like go full into like the fanciest, most important uh, person in the room. Kind of a character, you know. Like, and this has been this is there's a common pattern here. We saw it in the uh, the Necromancer poker room, and she's going to continue to <laughs> to inhabit these sorts of roles. And I just can't wait to see what happens next. So, yeah. Uh, cool. <laughs> Evital about town as as Admiral Evital. <laughs> Come up with some name. <laughs> Just head down to the docks, start bossing people around randomly. She's just going to like walk down to the docks and uh, observe. Nice, awesome. Um, observe yeah. preparations. Uh, the name I'm going to go with is badly up. Madliana Vetsaana? I'm trying to decide what rank I should give Avatala. Because <laughs> she is aware that she can't be the highest ranking. But she also can't be the lowest for obvious reasons. Her, her ego couldn't withstand it. Grand Admiral. Grand High Admiral, the, the five anchor Grand High Admiral, Evitala. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to be saying this, five anchor Grand High Vice Admiral. That's one step down. <laughs> one step down. I can't believe I've done it. <laughs> the group like going to be. I will only be a three star general because that would be too much. <laughs> <laughs> The group will be so proud of my humility. No, I'm surprised he didn't go three and a half star somehow. Alrighty. Um, <laughs> you begin making a name for yourself on the docks. <laughs> yep. I've just come back from a long and exciting uh What's the I mean, we are at war deployment? with Athis, right? So, yes. I mean, like, would there be any reason for some some person of some sort to go off by ship, maybe to do some kind of, like, supply stuff? I don't know. I don't know what the military purpose of something for the current conflict that we're in for, for the Navy. Athis does not have a Navy um, of the sort that you would understand from a Celebran perspective. Uh, they right. do have ships, but their ships do not sail in water. They ships yeah, have sand ships. Yeah, they're sand ships. They they're basically boats on skis that use wind to go over the sand. Um, they don't function outside of the desert, um, and they don't have any uh, ocean or body of ocean that's close enough to them that they would ever convert one into a seafaring vessel. But could it be feasible that the navy is exploring this technology for the? For the war effort. Uh, it is completely feasible that, you know, um, anything might be explored for any any purposes. Mostly the Navy's been in sort of a, uh, a conflict with Korloth. Not an active one. It's a very cold conflict. They're just kind of in a standoff kind of state. Like, we could take you, bro. It's like, yeah, we could take you, bro. But um, mm. none of them actually have, have gone at each other's throats. Both have unofficially encouraged piracy against the others. 
uh, but they are the rival uh, trade cities. So Libre gets all the good trade from the Middle Kingdoms. Uh, Korloth currently has um, sort of dominant trade coming from Aphthys. And the I hope could, could my story be that I was uh, recently uh, ransomed from after having been kidnapped by pirates? Oh, sure. Your like, story can be whatever you want it to be. <laughs> Would that be a realistic story? Of this thing? Uh, yeah, the Pirate Coast, uh, if, yeah, we see on the map there, between Half Elven and Korloth is an area called the Pirate Coast, and it's called that for a reason. Um, both countries have fostered um, uh, piracy um, and under the, the guise of... Um, privateering. Uh, yeah, privateering, basically. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's totally a thing. Piracy itself has actually spread quite a bit into Half Elven. Um, Half Elven has a thriving pirate community there. Um, that pirate community does have some pretty significant loyalties to the Celebrant Thieves Guild. Um, that is because they understand Violethan's coins, uh, and they will do anything to get one. Which gives Violethan, who has all the coins, an incredible amount of influence if he wants to get something done there. He can send a single agent with a single coin and basically get an entire uh, fleet going with just that. But otherwise, yeah, they're generally pirates. All right, that will be my story if anybody asks questions. <laughs> All right. So you you were you were kidnapped by pirates, acquired a grand admiral's uniform, and um, complete with medals, from what I understand. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. The, these were awarded to Paul by return for my bravery. <laughs> there you go. Incredible! Incredible! Just get like that strong main character syndrome and just go for it. That's the the fundamental result of this is that uh, numerous sailors who are uh, coming onto shore leave from various things absolutely want to take you into a tavern and hear all the stories. So <laughs> they're like, "Ty, this is cool." There, there may be a bit of the. Dude, check out this crazy person that's telling these <laughs> wild stories. There may be a little bit of that going on, but it's, you know, they're buying you drinks and they're listening to your stories. Absolutely. I'm telling them that each one's getting more and more exaggerated. Excellent. It would be fun, too, if you just kept exaggerating, but you give them a little wink and a nod so they, they're like, oh, she's fucking with us. Just to make it fun, you know? Like 90% of the story like, I tell you know, really seriously, but then I tell about that one time that I, you know, why is it like best? A, <laughs> pull like a Jack Sparrow and you like, you know, use two turtles to get back to, to, to an island or yeah. some shit. But then, then when you want to mix it up, you tell them a story that's actually true, um, and then you just like wink at them and you're like, yeah, but if you believe that. Uh, meanwhile, back at the caravan, uh, having examined uh, cart seven, which is just another guard cart, uh, you arrive at cart number eight. Um, Edgar returns, uh, having discussed security measures with his guard uh, captains, um, and he returns and says, ah, good, I'm, I'm glad I, I got to you in time for this cart. This, I was hoping to introduce you to the, uh, the doors. Uh, but uh, clearly you're already familiar with them. Entering this cart, you see that there is a prominent door frame right in the middle of the cart. Uh, and there are, uh, let's see. And there are six doors uh, placed in um, little contained uh, metal cages, basically, that are locked by key. So uh, Edgar takes out his key, unlocks um, the first cage. It says, uh, let us begin with my favorite door, if you don't mind. Of course, after you. He fits the door into the frame, feeds it a little marble, opens it, and steps in. Uh, 
and presumably you step in behind him into, um, it's another one of those 50 by 300, um, but this one is a wine cellar. It is packed. You, you have just enough room for the two of you to walk by as barrel after barrel and bottle after bottle of some of the finest vintages that have ever been grown in the West are just here in huge quantities. Wow, this is quite the collection. He says, yes, um, many people um, presume that wine is strictly for drinking, but amongst um, the upper classes, uh, it is a valued trade commodity, uh, particularly because it tends to increase in value over time rather than decrease. However, there also is the more traditional use for it, at which he selects a bottle and offers uh, to share a glass of a really, really fancy wine with you. Of course I accept. Yeah. All right, so they, you guys share a glass of wine. Um, it's, yeah. I don't know if it necessarily tastes <laughs> like a, a stack of gold that uh, weighs as much as you do, but it certainly has that kind of price tag on the label. Uh, he says this is the, the first of two carts that we uh, contain wine in. And as he takes you out and as you continue to sip, he opens up the, uh, the second door, which is another cart or another, another room um, also full of wine. Uh, and he's, after showing you that and closing the door, he brings out the third door and says, um, but we're not strictly the fruits of the grape. And he opens a door that is full of various spirits. Liquors of all varieties, fancy whiskeys, fancy um, vodkas, basically anything that can be fermented finds its way in here. I assume there's a good section of Ashta as well? There is, yes. About, um, you estimate that approximately the back quarter of the room is Ashta. And, and not this is not just like a stockpile of Ashta for... Uh, you know, reason. This is like really fine, high quality. This is the Ashta that's more of an Ashta. Yeah, this is not Ashta that's there for medicinal use to, to like get spirits out of people. This is Ashta that's there because it's the expensive stuff. This is the Ashta that's got a piece of the cactus floating inside it. Nice. Um, and then. Uh, Having closed that door, he brings out the fourth door of this um, this uh, cart. In the fourth door, um, uh, this is um, the answer to your question about our guards. And opening the door, um, there is, in many ways it looks similar to the liquor cart, um, but these are clearly magical potions. Uh, an entire room full of... Um, magical brews. And in this room, there's also some alchemical equipment for making more stuff. Are they goblins? Uh, do you ask this? No, I mean, I'm not there. I'm oh, you are, actually. You're, you're, oh, I am there? You're, you're the security detail, yeah. Oh. I saw him with the, with the gray-suited guy as well? Yes. Sorry, I was AFK um, for a part of it. Uh, uh, yeah. I do ask that. He says, no, but we have uh, purchased many of these from the goblins. They make an exceptional brew. Yes, uh, fine alchemists. We, we had to switch to using some of their stuff um, when we lost access to a particular artifact that we were using to increase the uh, strength and potency of our guards. Uh, we now have them um, making use of a potion that enlarges them and they, they fill out their uniforms quite nicely when it's time to fight. I see. Ingenious. All right. Rorok tries not to look down at her own biceps in, in contemplation. <laughs> yeah, when you're already big, you just get yeah, yeah. even bigger. Yeah, yeah. It's like, don't, don't think about how huge your traps are going to be. 
by the end of this, you're going to be, like, running around with a cloak of invisibility, just, like, enormous, because you've taken some po- potion that enlarges you. Yeah. It's, it's going to go from being a cloak of invisibility to your scarf of invisibility. Mm-hmm. All right, um, so he closes the door on that. Um, Does he, do, do, do I, I'm making note of which ones are, do, do I know which ones are the, the, the um, enlarging ones? And do I, I guess I wouldn't be able to know necessarily about. Not necessarily, but so far everything has been well labeled. True. Um, this is not somebody's private collection where they personally know it. This is part of a large, um, you know, organization of tens of this thousands of people. Audit. This is like an audit. Basically. Yeah, this is a this is an audit, and this is a this is a company. This is a guild, so they have tens of thousands of people that might be coming in here for any given reason, um, at least within the city of Salibra. Probably a lot more than that in Baron where they left. So yeah, thing, things are are well um, well labeled. Uh, you have to check things out. <laughs> There's like a little clipboard for checking out things if you're taking stuff. Yeah. Uh, and the sheer quantity that's in there is ridiculous. Um, not just quantity too, but variety. They have more than just the strength potions. There's lots of stuff going on in there. Um, the fifth door that he uh, inserts into the slot and opens, and he seems to be going, <laughs> going through a lot of these marbles, getting all these doors in. But the fifth one um, is ingredients. Uh, this consists of lots of things that you, you actually find fairly familiar from your trip to the moon. There's a lot of little um, stasis things, but instead of uh, flavorful food items, they are containing alchemical ingredients. Um, barrels of phoenix feathers and, uh, yeah, like crates of... Uh, uh, quill from the, the porcupines in the, the forest. That stuff, by the way, is super addictive and has a really high value as well, but it's considered illegal in a few places. Quill? Yes. Yeah, that's like, isn't that like super stimulant kind of shit? Yeah, quill basically gives you a, um, a focus of 10 temporarily, but it's ridiculously addictive. Um, here, of course, they're, they're labeling it not as a, a substance to use, but as an ingredient for potion making. Um, but yeah, uh, much like the other room, there's alchemical equipment here, but instead of potions, ingredients. And really rare, expensive, and questionably legal ingredients. And then, uh, closing that door, he opens up the final door, and he says, I, I have to ask before we open this door, uh, if anyone is engaging in um, pipe weed, I need to ask you to extinguish it before the door opens. And you see the door has uh, lots of labels that say caution, flammable, no open flames. Um, and once all everything is confirmed to be okay, he opens the door. And again, gigantic room, 50 feet by 300 feet by 12 feet of explosives in a lot of varieties. Liquids, powders, um, yeah. A huge quantity of explosives. Um, you don't know what would happen if it was detonated, because it's in some kind of extra-dimensional space. Yeah, uh, but they've given us the rope we're going to hang them with. Yeah, but if... if We hope. If taken out of that space, uh, this is sufficient stuff to blast apart a lot of things. Or, depending on how it's used, to supply ammunition for a lot of rifles. The, All the, right. The powder here could be used to make ammo cartridges. All right, and so he uh, closes that door. Uh, yeah, and uh, let's see. Cart number nine um, is guards. And then you get to cart number 10. Now, Remy, you've been nearby watching all this happen. Have you wanted to do anything? No. Okay. T- taking notes, I guess. Mm-hmm. He's done his job. <laughs> cool. So in cart number 10, um, 
similar thing. It actually looks almost identical to cart number eight, except that um, instead of uh, wine, spirits, potions, ingredients, and explosives, cart number eight has various metals. So the, the first door that is put in the slot and opened has uh, just row upon row of iron. Just draw, like, it's, it's not ore. This is iron ingots. It's already been smelted and refined, and you've got uh, just row upon row of iron ingots ready to be crafted into whatever they need. This has been the primary output of Baron. So um, it makes sense that they would have a huge amount of it. The mining cooperatives main source of revenue for most of its existence has been iron. And so it's um, also not much of a surprise when the second door contains the same thing but steel. Iron that has been um, uh, alloyed and turned into various grades of steel, um, all in ingot form and all ready to be made into weapons, armor, whatever might need to be crafted. So the opening of door number three comes as quite the visual surprise when the light that touches it from the magic lantern um, reflects back gold. Lots of gold. 50 feet by 300 feet by 12 feet stacked to the ceiling gold ingots. Full, like, thicker than your arm bars of gold. I will definitely try to conceal my excitement. But Barnabas is very excited. Uh, and he lets you take your time to tabulate it, although he does also have his own lists of how much is contained, but you're allowed to confirm the quantities. And then that I feel like I feel like anybody would be who hasn't seen that much at all at once. And most people don't. Even if you're a bureaucrat of some kind doing, doing yeah. inventory, it's probably still stunning to see that much. It, it's a lot of gold. And then uh, it mo he moves on to door number four, which is platinum. Oh man, is there going to be a myth for room? Row upon row of platinum. More platinum than you've ever seen. And platinum is at a premium right now because platinum is used in some of the new alloys with mithril that have been discovered that can make some really cool things for weapons. Blades that will cut through a floor if you just like leave them standing and you'll just have the, the hilt sticking up as the blade rocks back and forth, slicing the floor. Lightsaber kind of stuff. Uh, they call it um, uh, blue mithril. It's, uh, and it's, it's brittle, but it's crazy sharp. Um, which brings us to door number five, which is mithril ingots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Refined yeah. mithril, row upon row of it, stacked to the ceiling, an unbelievable supply of mithril. Um, he does have a chart, however, uh, in which there are scheduled examinations to confirm that the mithril is still mithril. Apparently, there is a bit of a problem with what they call moon mithril, which is mithril that um, came from a particular heist of the moon that seems to spontaneously transform itself back into regular old silver. Isn't it kind of more like a half-life? Or... Yeah, basically. Um, and so th this mithril is uh, on a, a regular testing schedule, and there are a couple shelves that seem to have been emptied. Um, so it, it looks like they may have actually caught a couple uh, shipments of moon mithril and got them removed from the records. So not, it, it's only like 90% as much as there was in the platinum and gold ingot sections, um, but it's still massive. And then cart six, and there's been sort of an escalation going here. Iron, steel, gold, platinum, mithril. Ooh, I have a guess, but. What's your guess? It's that, it's that, it's the dust. It's that uh, sort of processing refuse from the mithril. Incorrect. That's an interesting guess. Um, the, the largest quantity of that dust that's ever uh, been gathered in one place is in the form of a single coin. Yeah, I know. And that's why I was like, wouldn't it be funny? It's just like, beep, just like one little <laughs> coin. <laughs> just one little coin. The whole, whole, whole thing. Uh, no, what's in it are Bennington cylinders. Yeah. Bennington is a an alloy that was invented by the lithokinetic Bennington, who named it after himself. Um, 
He invented this alloy as a way to contain explosions more effectively. Uh, these cylinders come in a variety of shapes, including the, the sizes and shapes that you would use for rifles and the sizes and shapes you would use for cannons. Um, none of them are assembled into weapons, but all of them gleam with that possibility on their, their dark charcoal uh, metal surfaces. They're kind of like a charcoal gray, but they, uh, knowing what they are and what they can do, these are supremely heat resistant, blast resistant uh, metals that can withstand the, the forces of huge explosions happening inside them to propel projectiles. And um, the, um, there's a couple organizations that make significant use of them. Um, of course, the Tanker Gnomes first figured out how to turn them into rifles, um, but the... Um, now that Dala has fell, fallen, that's not much of an industry anymore. Um, nevertheless, the um, Mage Registry loves to use rifles because it gives them that edge that they need against magic users to be able to hit them at range. And that is the end of car number 10. Excellent. He is... Um, Says it. It's going to be a bit of a lit down after that to show you um, the last cart. So cart eleven, more guards, and then you get to cart twelve. He says, uh, "This one's just paperwork." Uh, I know the other ones are fancy. This one is not. Um, in order to keep track of all of this stuff, a large bureaucracy is necessary. Uh, and so, opening up the cart, there is um, just stacks and stacks of papers. Um, and there's a, a door. The door is currently actually active and open. And inside it, there are um, members of the mining cooperative's scribes um, working. They are using the door because the extra dimensional space doesn't bump. It's not bouncing when the cart is rolling. So they use it to just have a, a smooth, clean working environment. They keep the door open. Uh, they have um, potions of air breathing in case it ever accidentally closes and spare marbles to re-trigger it. But... Um, yeah, that's that's that location. All right. Do I sense anything? Um, I guess I could run it, roll an investigation check, but it, like, yep. do I sense anything else around there? Go ahead, roll your check. Um, it occurs to you that if they had incriminating documents about nobility, this is where those documents would be. Um, it's not clear to you exactly where they would be here, and you'd probably need some time without the scribes here to check. Um, you also uh, realize that they could have used this technique to make a stable place for doing alchemy as well, and have chosen not to. Interesting, yeah. All right. Um, cool. Yeah, well, I guess the, I'll pack up. The stone cutting and the alchemy table. like The alchemy tables are in rooms like this, but there's nobody there. And the stone cutting table isn't even in a room like this, although it totally could have been. And it didn't appear like there were any people in those carts either, whereas here right, there are people. Here there are people, and there's an active uh, bureaucracy doing some record keeping here, which is suspiciously different from all the other carts. Do, do I detect, um, or can I tell, like, the allegiance of these people? Like, where they're from, their origin? Sorry, what'd you say? Their, their allegiance appears to be to the mining cooperative. Okay, cool. Alrighty, and uh, respe respecting our desire to keep these to a, a limited time scale, uh, I think we're going to conclude it for the evening, but um, just to give a, an update, uh, Tice, you do finish your research, and Avatala, you finish your reputation building. Oh, that's why I was doing. I, I presume <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to find out how that all comes together. So am I. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. I'll kick off the points. Uh, so, a uh, point to Viv for hiding in plain sight as a Grand Admiral who was kidnapped by pirates and has ridiculous stories to tell. Um, Chris for planting the obvious mark of the Fisherman's Guild. I'm curious to see what comes of that. Uh, Jackie for tackling a horse. And Tice for learning a new spell. I think it was the spell shell, the spell shell spell. Yep. Um, okay. <coughs> I'll give one to um, I'll give one to uh, Jackie for uh, um, yeah. My, my my achievement is uh, not not horsing around. You know, by taking out that horse. Um, I won for Eben. I won for Eben is um, is. Is a uh, horseplay for using the horse to distract. Um, I'm giving one to uh, Raf for. Um, I don't know. I just want to be fancy uh, for just dressing up and seeing where it goes. And I want to give one to um, Shifty for for um, for the. Or um, uh, for figuring out that the uh, that there was uh, that they're using the same technology that we have the doors, um, doors to door salesman is what I gave you. All right. Well, I will uh, go. Uh, point to Tice for. Um, gave, finally gave this new spell done with the aid of the uh, Vagifaldi that we definitely just acquired and did not have the entire time. Uh, point to Kristen for um, being the main one to just get all the work done this uh, episode and um, have a full inventory of all the stuff that we're going to try to uh, steal. Uh, point to Chris for um, coming up with the, this absolutely insane plan to mark the store and make it look like it's the fish guild stewing. Um, I, I think that was a uh, really ingenious, and uh, particularly when you just could ignore the fact that this, everybody was looking at you, that was quite, quite good. Um, and point to Jackie for being a big meathead himbo. Jack Moon! <laughs> All right, um, I'll go uh, to uh, Jackie for uh, being a rodeo clown and wrestling a wrestling a horse, and uh, just for. That satisfying moment. Thank you for doing that for all of us. I look good in front of the boss. Yeah. Uh, Kristen, for your patience and auditing skills. It's nice to know what we're finally working for. So thank you for that. Uh, Ties for your beautiful mind and uh, finally working out that spell for us. And uh, Viv, for uh, as far as I can tell, cosplaying Captain Morgan. No. He, he dressed up like a sailor and took people drinking and telling stories. Well, yeah, that that part's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I like that the plan. No, my favorite part was just your dedication to the character. Your your plan was dedicated to your outfit, and that was it. Um, the outfit was the plan, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Hey, I need to be a disguise. (laughs) (laughs) 
Is that everybody? Oh, I have to make points. Um, Chris, for your flawless execution on your stealth roll for planting that uh, fishing guild uh, emblem. Uh, Kristen, for your basically perfect portrayal of a uh, some sort of diplomat, dignitary, important administrative person. Um, just, I don't think anyone suspects anything unusual is happening to you, so well done. Um, point to Viv for being the so extra as I, in my wildest dreams, oh, just you're living your best life. You're being so extra and I'm here for it and I can't wait to see uh, what bad decisions I've inspired you to do will take us next. Um, and to Tice, of course, for his, uh, I mean, like you've been cracking away at this spell for a long time. So I'm like super happy that everything's coming together, man. Like you've been super diligent. We've got our skeleton crew because of you. We've got these bags of holding. Like magically figured out, the doors figured out. So that's like we've got a lot of really good tech uh, lined up for whatever happens next. And so oh wait, did I? I gave Chris. I gave Chris a point, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I was gonna say since uh, Tice uh, refrained from grave robbing and filling the uh, the <laughs> doors that you guys have with um, corpses. You do have a pair of doors uh, that are in every way identical except for the contents within of the ones being used by your mark. So I'm excited to see what plans you guys come up with to make use of that. Yeah, I have Don't a lot. Don't mean uh, what outfits we're going to choose? I'm also excited <laughs> to see what outfits we're Barnabas can't wait. Alrighty, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and we will pick up um, either next week or uh, the week after that when Ed gets back. We'll see. Cool. 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 cool.